Hello, everyone. My name is Sister Estelle, and on behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this retreat hour with Father Ron Rollheiser. We are so grateful to be able to gather with all of you during this time of separation. Our recording of today's retreat will be available later to share with anyone who couldn't join us on our website. And we will send you a link so you can get a copy of Father Rollheiser's book, Domestic Monastery, on which this retreat is based. There will be a short question and answer period at the end of this hour. So feel free to post your questions or thoughts through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and Father will respond as time allows. As you know, today, Father will be speaking to us on Domestic Monastery, Finding Peace at Home. Father Ron is a Catholic priest, an internationally known community builder and speaker, and is among the most popular spiritual writers today. His retreats and workshops have inspired thousands. He is a specialist in the fields of spirituality and systematic theology, and a New York Times bestselling author. In 2005, Father Ron became the president of the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas, a position he maintains to this day. His regular column in the Catholic Herald is featured in newspapers worldwide he is the author of over 15 published books, including bestsellers such as The Holy Longing and Sacred Fire, also The Passion and the Cross, Wrestling with God, Bruised and Wounded, Struggling to Understand Suicide, and his newest title, Domestic Monastery. Thank you so much, Father Ron, for leading this retreat hour today. Thank you, Sister Estelle, and I want to thank also all the people at, at uh, Paraclete Press, particularly John Sweeney, who, was, who gave the idea for this book. Um, so I want to thank all of them, and I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is probably a pretty timely time to talk about this because uh, the coronavirus is really, in a certain sense, if I can use an expression, has made us all monks by conscription. So we're all confined to our, our own particular monasteries, if I could put it this way. So it's secluding us and it's binding us into some very tight community living. And so um, um, we, we are in a monastery, whether we want to be at this time or not. As you can see from the outline, you can all see the outline here. I'll keep that posted. I wanna do three things with you this afternoon. <clears throat> I wanna talk, I wanna give you a two minute promise it won't be longer, a two-minute history of monasticism, since we're going to use the word monastery. And then I want to talk about the concept of a domestic monastery. What does it mean, to a domestic monastery? But most of the time I want to spend on, now I have listed 10 principles. I may not do all of them because we're going to have another session on Friday, um, but certainly I'll give you the, the key principles for living domestic monastery in our houses. Now, the two-minute um, history of monasticism. You know, monasticism as we know it in the West, earlier, prior to monasticism, we know they were desert fathers and desert mothers, but they were hermits. That's a little different kind of a lifestyle. They live alone, but monasticism, as we have it in Christianity, was founded in really the, the sixth century by St. Benedict, very famous saint, he lived in Italy about 80 miles out of Rome, and he founded a very famous monastery called Monte Cassino, which still exists today. It's been uh, operating without stop since really 529. It's a beautiful place. Um, and he, Benedict, wrote the rules of monasticism. And I'm going to get into some of them, you know, how they can apply to family life. And um, uh, his rule is usually, <clears throat> it was written in Latin. But usually just they put it under two words, ora et labora, ora et labora, which are Latin words to pray and to work. He said monasteries are places to pray and to work. And then about a thousand years later, um, or 900 years later in 1090, um, St. Bernard in France, um, 
he took the monastic rule and he reshaped it slightly and um, uh, um, produced what we today we call the Trappist, the Cistercian monastery, which is, is, is a little slightly different version of monasticism. Now, that's the two minute history. I wanna go into the concept of a domestic monastery. Aura et labora. You know, the, the idea of monastery and monasticism has always been implicit in Christian spirituality, but as I wanna say, it, it, it's not much grasped or not much understood. Uh, in fact, to the contrary, so that um, two things have um, kind of made this an exotic word for us. Uh, one of them is that really, um, until the Reformation, where Martin Luther, um, you know, reacted against the Martin Luther was a monk, but then reacted against monasticism. Um, monasticism was always seen as a, it was a higher vocation. So nuns and pre uh, uh, monks who lived in monasteries, they were considered the spiritual elite. So obviously this wouldn't mean much to the average person. So you had the, they were the spiritual elite. And it was considered a higher vocation. And Martin Luther reacted very strongly against that. He said, no, we're all priests from our, from our baptism. And, and Jesus' call to um, holiness is the same for everybody. Now, in Roman Catholicism, we didn't buy into that until actually Vatican II. But today, we would be at the same place where Martin Luther was at. Now, but also very important, even more important, the concept was misunderstood. I can put this quite simply, you know, for years and years, really for centuries, most of the classical, or pardon me, many of the classical spiritual writings, deep spiritual writings, were written by monks and nuns. John of the Cross, Thomas of Kempis, you know, Teresa of Avila, the other trees and so on, or anchorites like Julian of Norwich. And so there were people who were out of the world. And so their, their writings, and you're gonna see their language, which I'm gonna to try to translate for you, um, didn't mean much to people. So I'll give you a simple example, and we're gonna come back on this one. But Thomas of Kempis wrote the book, The Imitation of Christ, which next to the Bible, is the most sole Christian book ever, okay? But if you pick up The Imitation of Christ and you try to read it, there'll be many parts that will absolutely confuse you and put you off. I'm gonna look at some of them. For instance, he says, uh, uh, every time you leave your cell, you come back less a person. So really, every time you leave your room, you're gonna, you, you lose something spiritually. See, so this was misunderstood and the same with the works of John at the Cross was a great mystic, and I spent a lot of um, my life researching, teaching John of the Cross. Um, but if you read him without, what I say the next point is, what needs to be done now when we're doing this is what we call retrieval work, retrieval, which means you go in and you pull the principles out of Thomas Kempis and John of the Cross and people like this, and you show how they're really applicable to everybody. And that's what we're gonna do in these next, today and, and Friday, you know try to pull principles out of monasticism and show you they're really principles for family life. They're really principles for living for everybody. Uh, I mark three people here who have done a lot of work on that. Uh, David Steinelrast, who is a Benedictine monk, um, was the first person I think who more or less did this explicitly and you know, kind of at some length. And then Daniel Berrigan, the, the, the social justice man. And then ironically, James Hillman, Who's, who just died, who was a philosopher and a Jungian, but an agnostic. But Hillman, writing as an agnostic, pulled a lot of principles out of uh, monasticism just for daily life, and we'll try to come to them. So that's by way of introduction. What does this mean? If you haven't got it yet, it's okay. Um, I think you're going to get it by the examples. What does it mean that what we want to do the next two, today and, and Friday, is to look at monastic literature and pull out from monasticism key principles for life. You know, how, how what, whatever house you're living in, whether you're living with a family or whether you're living alone or whatever, that to pull out principles um, for monastic living. How do you make your own um, house a domestic monastery? How do you make it aura at labora? You know, to pray and to work. And to situate this, I want to begin with a story. 
um, and um, which, which hopefully will, will help set the stage here. And it comes from Carlo Coretto. Now, Carlo Coretto was a monk. And Carlo Coretta was an Italian, he was a priest, but then he became a monk. And then for 24 years of his life, he lived in the Sahara Desert by himself. And while he was living there, he did a lot of praying, a lot of reflecting, wrote some wonderful spiritual books. He also learned the Bedouin language and he translated the Bible into the Bedouin language and so on. And he wrote these marvelous spiritual books. For instance, one of his books called Letters from the Desert. Uh, beautiful, you know. Um, but anyway, the, the point I want to make is he lived for 24 years by himself, praying night and day. And then he went home to visit his mother. And his mother is an Italian uh, woman, and she had raised a big family. He was a child of lots of kids, like 10 or 12 kids in their family and so on. And he said, it was very interesting. He said, i had been a monk living by myself for 24 years. He said, I went to visit my mother, he said, who went through many years of her life when she was a young mother, where she didn't have time to do anything. You know, sometimes you'll see um, um, our domestic duties, the duties of our work and so on. Um, they, 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 they hurry us so much we struggle to go to the bathroom. I remember some you know, one mother told me once, she said, when I was raising preschool kids, she said, there were days I didn't have time to go to the bathroom. I'd be in the bathroom to be a little hand under the door saying, you know, mommy, mommy, I need you, you know. Well, Coretto said, I met my mother and I realized she was more contemplative than I was. He said, she was more contemplative than I was. He said, not that there's anything wrong with living in a monastery, he said, but there can be something very right about living as my mother lived and so on. See, there, if you see, there are different vocations. Some of us, like myself, I'm a priest uh, or nuns and so on. Um, in our lives, even though we're very busy, time is set aside for prayer, for formal prayer, for liturgy, for liturgy of the hours and so on. Lots of people can't do that, you know? And so you're meant to be a monk in a different sense. So anyway, that's just a story. He lived for a monastery in a monastery for 24 years. He made him contemplative. He says, his mother raised a large family. He had made her a contemplative. He said, she was as much a monk as I was. Okay, now, I want to take some principles from monasticism, very famous principles, and I want to use them to illustrate how we living in whatever situation you're living, whether you're married and raising kids, whether you're single, whether you're living in a convent, or no matter what you're doing, or your kids have already been raised, like, how do we apply the principles of, of uh, St. Benedict, who wrote the, on Bora et labora, how do we apply them to our life? Now, 10 points. I'm not sure if we'll get all 10 of them today, but um, we'll begin. And the first one, the first principle of, of, of Benedict is this, a monk needs to regulate his or her life by the monastic bell. It's an interesting question, as a statement. You need to regulate your life by the monastic bell. Now, let me explain the monastic bell. In monasteries, even today, and even today they have digital clocks and they have every kind of, they still run their lives by a bell. So for every activity, a bell rings. A bell rings to wake them up in the morning. A bell rings to call them to prayer. A bell rings to call them to meals. A bell rings when they should go to work. A bell rings when the work period is over. A bell rings when it's time to go to, to, um, to um, recreation. A bell rings when the recreation is over. And so it's, so it's, a monk's life is regulated by the bell. Now it sounds harsh, but you're gonna see it's not. And then he, in fact, is a very famous line that's often quoted in spiritual literature where Benedict says, a monk's life is regulated by the bell. He said, and the bell, when the bell rings, he said, you stop what you're doing and you move on to the next thing. He said, so he, for instance, if you're writing a letter, that's his famous line, he said, if you're writing a letter, and you have to cross the T, the bell rings, you put the pen down, you don't cross the T, so it, it's calling you to the next stage of your life. And he said, you go there, it's very, this is very important, he says, you're called there, he said, you go there not because you want to, but because time isn't your time, it's God's time, and you're called there on God's time. Now, that sounds harsh, but it isn't. 
we don't run our lives in the world by monastic vows, except we, we kind of do, okay? Um, let me give you an example. When your alarm clock goes off at six o'clock in the morning and you only don't want to get up, you get up not because it's time, you want to because it's time, you know? And then you got to feed kids and you got to drive people to work and you got to go to work and you got to punch the clock and you have to do all these things. And when you come home, you have to do grocery shopping. You have to see uh, our, our bell is not some bell that rings. It's alarm clocks, it's schedules, it's work that has to be done. Uh, and we move from activity to activity as Benedict says, not because we want to, he said, because time isn't our time. He said, it's God's time. And, um, and so that, uh, I love that line. He just says, you, your, your life is regulated by the monastic bell. I don't live in a monastery. I live by alarm clocks and schedules, but they are as, as conscriptive as any monastic bell in a monastery. Um, but also when he says time isn't our time, he says it's God's time. Um, that's very important. He says, um, we, we, you're going to see the third part. It'll teach you everything you need to know. So that's the first regulation. <clears throat> Regulate your life by the monastic bell. Then secondly, he said, stay in your cell. Stay in your cell. Thomas, Thomas Akemphis in the Imitation of Christ. Um, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. I'm just going to take a drink of water or two. <clears throat> Thomas says, every time you leave your cell, you come back less a person. Now, again, unless you retrieve that from monastic context, that's a terrible statement. It's kind of, you leave your room, you come back, you somehow you've lost something spiritually. No, I can translate that very simply. Cell means your commitments. Stay in your lane. Every time you're unfaithful to your commitments, you've left your cell. If a married person has an affair, they've left their cell. If you're a parent, you neglect your kids, you've, le you've, you've uh, left your cell. Well, Any time we're unfaithful to God, and faithful to each other. Um, that's what he said, stay in your cell. You know, um, we're, we're inside of commitments, we're inside of families, we're inside of churches, we're inside of uh, workplaces and so on. Um, we need to be radically honest there. We need to stay in our cell, you know. And when, when runners run, they say, they always are told, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. You know, so, but here the cell means not, again, some room, um, it, 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 that, that, that why this is deep wisdom. It's not some room you're living in or some house you live in. It's all the commitments you live in. You know, anytime I'm unfaithful in whatever way to God, to my priestly vocation, to my family, to whatever, anytime I betray a trust, I'm leaving myself. And see, so that's a, the second monastic principle. It's a beautiful principle. Stay inside your cell. Then thirdly, he said, let your cell teach you everything you need to know. You know, <clears throat> now, again, cell here, as I said, doesn't mean a room. It doesn't mean a house. It means all your commitments. So that, uh, you know, and this is, this is um, uh, just a, 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 a succinct way to word some very deep Christian wisdom and, and spirituality. You know, um, when I was growing up, my parents had this, but they had this under a different language, you know, and they, they had something like in my parents' spirituality, had, they had something they called duties of state, your duties of state. So, for instance, as a married person, as a mother, as a father, as a Christian man, as a Christian woman, as an adult, as somebody who worked, you had, they called them your duties of state. These are the work, this is the work that God gave you. And that's your work to do. And the whole idea is that is your spirituality. If you do that well, that is prayer. And also it's going to teach you. I mean, scripture teaches us, homilies teach us, spiritual reading teaches us. He said, but nothing teaches you as deeply as your own work, as your own commitments. You know, if you're a parent, um, you say, well, um, <clears throat> by being a parent, First of all, I almost have a humor. I say, you know what happens when you're parents? Your kids raise you. You get married, you're immature. Um, kids raise their parents and so on. 
but being a parent will teach you what you need to know. That, that is your duty of state or your, your marriage, or if you're a sister or you're a priest or you're a, a layman working in the world or whatever, even our jobs, just, you know, if you put those three together, regulate your life by the monastic vow, but then stay in your commitments, stay in your commitments. <clears throat> and then your commitments, they're going to teach you everything you need to know. You know, as a parent, it's going to teach you spirituality. As a husband or wife, it's going to teach you spirituality. As a teacher, as a plumber, as well, whatever, if you're, <clears throat> whatever your work, if you're being honest, um, it's going to teach you and it's going to lead you to God. Um, you know, it's interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a wonderful text. Incidentally, these are allergies. We are just living with very, very strong oak here right now in the area which, which, which gets to me. There's a wonderful text in scripture, and it's the text where um, uh, Jesus calls Peter at the end of John's gospel. And remember that famous text where he asked Peter, do you love me? So he takes Peter aside. He says, says, Simon, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Then he asked him a second time. He said, Simon, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord. He said, feed my sheep. Then he asked him a third time, Simon Peter, do you love me? He said, and Peter was grieved that the Lord would ask him three times. But as we know, Peter had betrayed Jesus three times. So Jesus wants three um, affirmations of fidelity. And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. But then Jesus asked this. He said, Simon, he said, because you said this, he said, up to now, you've walked your, you, you've part of, up to now, you have gird your belt and you have walked wherever you wanted to walk. But now others will put a rope around you and lead you where you would rather not go. See, that, 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 you know, that's what our, our duties of state do, your cell. Your cell puts a rope around you and it takes you where you'd rather not go, which is really into self sacrifice, into community, and into maturity. You know, we don't psych ourselves into maturity, we're dragged into maturity by our duties and all the things that, that take us there. Um, so let yourself teach you everything you need to know. And wherever you are, whatever your work, and every your vocation, that is your monastic cell. Stay in your cell and let it teach you everything you need to know. Then I want to break the two words up, ora et labora, pray and work. Okay. First of all, pray. Now it's interesting. I want to make a, all of us, I'm sure, pray. You know, uh, monks pray in a special way. You know, and I want to emphasize two things about monks' prayer, and that we should be doing too. And first of all, monks primarily they pray for the world. So you know, all the offices that monks chant and the Eucharist that the monks celebrate, that's not for themselves. You know, when you say Vespers or Lauds or any of the, you know, the, the office of the church, when, when people chant that and monks sing it and pray it, it's always, this is prayer for the world. We're praying through Christ, through the church, but for the world. It's not prayer for the, the church. It's not prayer for the monks themselves. It's prayer for the world. Um, you know, and that is something that is in us. We, we, most of us were baptized as children, as babies, and so we weren't alert to our own baptism. But in our baptism, there's actually a covenant made, which your parents and godparents make for you. And the covenant you make is that you are going to, as an adult, as, a, as an adult, you are going to pray for the world habitually. That means kind of daily, regularly, you pray for the world. Uh, the prayer isn't for ourselves. Remember, Jesus says... Uh, my flesh is food for the life of the world, not even for the life of believers, you know. See, so that uh, monks and nuns and in, uh, in monasteries, they chant office. They pray uh, what we call the office of the church. And, uh, but it's very important. This is prayed not for themselves, but for the world. So as we're in our cell, our vocation, whatever it is, that we need to be praying not we need to pray for ourselves and our loved ones and so on. There's crisis. We pray for health and so on. But as adults, and that's the mark of our maturity, 
we're praying for others, praying for the world. And then this is interesting. Um, monks, in their prayer, they try to, to meet, and this is a metaphor, it's a beautiful metaphor I've taken from David Steinel last, but he says, um, we try to pray and in our prayer to meet the angels of the hour. That's a beautiful metaphor. So who are the angels of the hour? Well, it's interesting in monastic prayer, it's set to different times during the day. So for instance, they, they'll pray in the middle of the night, some monks, what they call vigils, they're trying to meet the angels of night. And then in the morning, when you're doing lauds and morning prayer, you're trying to meet the angels of the morning. Midday prayer, you're trying to meet the angels of noon. The Vespers, you're trying to meet the angels of late afternoon. Compline, you're trying to meet the angels that, of the, that, that are they're putting you to sleep, and so on. Now, it's a metaphor. It means this. You know, we, we don't realize how often our mood, how not often, just generally, our mood is, is, is attuned to the, the hours of daylight of the sun. So for instance, we get up in the morning, it's fresh, you know, and there, there's a newness, a day is in front of you. Um, Steinle asked would say, you're special angels. You meet the angels of newness. You meet the angels of sunrise. At noon, the sun is hot. You're in the middle of the day. You meet a different kind of angel. You meet the angel of noon, the angel of the hot sun. In late afternoon, as Vespers, your work has just shut down. There's a different mood. There's a different feeling. And you go there and you meet the angel of, you know, as you, as you let your work down, you're getting ready for your dinner hour. And then at night, before you go to bed, you meet the angels. And for, for some people, the angels of the hour at night might not be that you're even praying. It might be that's when you have your little zip of wine with your family. You're meeting the angels of night. And then... Um, in the middle of the night, if we do vigil, vigils, I'll talk about that separately, we end up meeting the angels at night. We end up doing vigils and so on. It's a beautiful metaphor. But, you know, if, if you pray at those hours, uh, and even if we don't explicitly pray at those hours, notice that how, how our feelings, our mood, is very often just attuned to the time of day. Like right now, it's mid-afternoon. Um, that's a very different feeling than 9 o'clock in the morning which is even a different feeling at seven o'clock in the morning when the sun's rising. And it'll be a much different feeling tonight at 6.30, you know? Um, I like this, 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 this beautiful metaphorical image. There's angels to be met at each hour. And that's why monks set their prayer. They have so many hours of prayer and they call it the hours. That's why it's often called the hours because they're meant to be prayed at certain hours that you, 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 you and you pray for the world is experiencing that particular hour. It's beautiful then work. Um, part of monasticism is that you earn your living, that there's no free meal for anybody. Um, I mean, there are if we're handicapped, the sick and so on, but um, so that you don't become a monk. Monasticism isn't about a free ride. So the thing about monks and monasticism is you work. You earn your own bread, at least when you're healthy and you're prime of life and so on. You help take care of others um, so that uh, and so that Benedict and, and Bernard, they really believe that th th it's, it's a twin highway to God. We get to God through prayer and we get to God through work. And again, the work, very important. The work is like, um, it's like the prayer. It's not for the monastery. It's not for ourselves. It's for the world. You know, um, if anybody goes to a monastery to become a monk, you know, or a nun there, to escape the world, it's a bad, bad vocation. You don't go there, you don't go to the desert to try to get away from the world. If you are, it's wrong, you know. You go there to actually enter the world more deeply. And, you know, there's a great paradox here that, you know, that's exactly the vocation of those who are professional monks. That was the vocation of Thomas Merton. Let's use Thomas Merton as an example. As a young man, Thomas Merton was this brilliant young intellectual, very, very gifted writer, very, very gifted man, very articulate young man, um, who wanted to really do something for the world, to immerse himself in the world, and he ended up almost killing himself. You know, he uh, 
somehow he couldn't connect. So um, by the time he went to join the Trappist, he was living on alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, his health was no longer good. He was actually going to end up dying, and he just couldn't make friends in the world. Then he goes to a monastery, and he spends the rest of his life there. And while he's in the monastery, he's actually secluded from the world. And then he was able to enter the world more deeply than 95% of the people who ever live in the world. You know, he became this kind of heartbeat that has influenced and touched so many lives. You know, his flesh became food for the life of the world as Jesus' flesh became food for the life of the world. So now again, Merton was a professional monk. We aren't. But that means the, the work we do, the work you're doing in the world for family, it is for your family. It is to support your family, to support yourself and support your loved ones. But that has a wider purpose, you know, always because your family doesn't exist for itself. Your family also exists for the world. Uh, so that uh, it puts you into the world. Then, to live in quiet, to be in touch with the mild. You know, a uh, part of monasticism in all traditions. You notice I have a very cheap water bottle. It needs to be upgraded. But, uh, in all monasteries, although they cut this differently, some monks live in complete quiet, like the Trappists. You know, they try to live in Trappistines, they try to live in complete quiet and silence. In fact, when they were living at their strictest, they used to have a sign language. They wouldn't speak to each other in words. They'd use sign language and so on. Um, and then like other orders like the Benedictines are much more social and they have recreation together and so on. But in all monasteries, there's a special reverence and place for silence. And uh, for two reasons. One of them is, and and that's psychological, as we all know that. There's a certain kind of inner work. There's some important inner work we can only do in silence. Now, of course, the other part of that equation is there's also important inner work we can only do with each other, you know. Um, but I want to quote John of the Cross. John of the Cross says, uh, if you're in a monastery, he says, um, he said, get in touch with the mild. Get in touch with the mild. He said, and the mild will put you in touch with the real mild, which is kind of the mildness of God. Um, so basically saying that, you know, what we're, what we're meant to, to find in silence is to touch what's gentle inside of yourself, inside of others, and inside of the world. You know, it, it, maybe I can express this by its opposite. You know, sometimes you're in a crowd or you're at a family table or you're in a community and so on, and you start arguing about politics, this and that and the more it gets, the more angry people are, and the more, you know, and, uh, um, and you have to pull away to, you know, your, your insights are agitated, you know, you have to pull away or you're having an argument with somebody. And in silence, sometimes, tragically, in silence, we just marinate ourselves in our, in our wounds. But silence is meant to still our insights and to bring us, to make us gentle again, you know. See, so that the purpose of silence in monasteries, as John of the Cross says, is, is to touch the mile to be able to touch what's gentle inside of yourself, um, to, to try to, what's gentle inside of others, what's gentle inside of the world. Remember as a young priest reading the memoirs or, or kind of the spiritual advice of Catherine Doherty, found at the Madonna House Workers. And Catherine Doherty says, whenever I go to pray, she said, if I have a long period of silence, she said, what I'll do, she says, I will uh, sit in chapel or kneel in chapel whatever your posture is, and she says, and I'll just run almost like a video, face after face of all the people I live with, of all the people I've argued with, of the people I've hurt me, she said, and I'll just look at their face long enough until it becomes gentle, until I become gentle inside, you know, or the man who was my spiritual director at the seminary is now a, a bishop, in fact, a wonderful man, and he always told me, he says, you know, he says, whenever I get angry, whenever I get really frustrated, I'm just torn up. He said, I said, I just go to a chapel. He said, and I go sit in a chapel and I just promise myself, I'm not going to walk out of this chapel until that anger dissipates, until I can be gentle inside. You know, uh, that's the purpose of monastic silence. And we have to find a place for it in our homes or wherever. Now, that 
by it, it's all cement to put us in touch with nature. So that, um, <clears throat> um, that, that that's why monasteries, as you know, are, are generally built in countrysides, in beautiful surroundings, you know, with trees, with woods, with, uh, with water, with mountains or something. The whole idea is that um, nature also works as, 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 a, as a gentlifier inside of ourselves, you know. That not just that we see God, we see God in nature, but also nature is meant to make your heart gentle. Nature is a chapel. Like this priest said, whenever I got angry, get frustrated in arguments, I just go and sit in chapel until I could feel myself being gentle again. Um, nature, you can sit in nature until you feel yourself being gentle again. And then importantly, it's interesting, monks and, um, um, and, and contemplative nuns and stuff, Oftentimes they live what would look on the outside like pretty austere lives and they do fasting and all kinds of stuff for summer vegetarians and so on. But the irony is part of monasticism is also they are, are, are they try to teach themselves to thoroughly enjoy and touch the food you eat. So the food may be very simple, may be very earthy, um, but it's just it's thoroughly enjoyed. You know, it's the opposite. Sometimes you can go to the most expensive restaurant in the city and have an $85 steak and not enjoy it or be in touch with it at all. Your heart and mind are a lot of other things and you don't know where this, 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 this steak came from and so on. In monasteries, it'd be the opposite. You're eating simply. You're eating simple. And oftentimes the food is, is simple but wonderful, like whole wheat bread. I remember living in the the Trappist some summers in their monastery in Lafayette, Oregon. And, uh, you know, they would grind their own wheat and make the solid whole wheat bread. And they would grind their own peanuts and make their own peanut butter and so on. And, uh, and you deck that and you know, you'd cover it with some marmalade or something. And it was just, it was, this wasn't an $80 steak in a restaurant. Trust me, it's some of the finest food I've ever eaten, you know. And the monk, is given permission inside of herself or her himself to enjoy that. You know, you're meant, because food is also meant to make you gentle. Now, second, I need to uh, move the cursor here. Oops. Um, understand your family as a school of charity. Um, it's interesting. Uh, this is one of the, this is in monastic literature, but it's also in a lot of classical literature where they would say families, your family is a school of charity. If you're a monk, your community is a school of charity. Your workplace is a school of charity. And as a younger man, I, I always thought of that in a, in a very naive kind of way. So I'd always think of it this way that, uh, um, you know, like you live with a family, and there's lots of tensions there and you, they, there's immaturities and then you get, you have a chance to, uh, to, um, you know, practice patience and so on. And, it, you know, you're putting up on other people's faults. Um, that's not exactly the image, you know, let me give you an image. Um, when I was a seminarian one summer, I worked at one of our retreat centers in Saskatchewan and, um, one of the priests who was working at the treat center, he was an artist and he did a lot of different things with art and so on. And one of the things he would do, he was a rock collector, but he didn't collect, you know, rocks into a, you know, rock pets or something, but he would take long walks by the river and he got a chance to go to the coast and ocean. He'd walk and he'd pick up rocks that looked beautiful. And then in the basement of a retreat center, he had a, a, a polishing machine. It was a drum and this drum was filled with water and with gravel and rocks. And so he would pick up these rocks, these beautiful rocks by, by the river and so on. And he would put them into this drum and start this water, gravel stuff. And he started for several weeks. He put the rock in there and this gravel stuff would be churning this rock and hitting it for several weeks. Then he'd open up, he'd pull the rock out. And sometimes if the rock was really sand, it was all gone. But if it was a gem, you know what happened? all that grinding polished his gem into a spectacularly beautiful rock. It knocked all the rough edges off. It took all the, the silt and all the stuff out of it. So he just had a, a pure, pure diamond type of rock. 
Well, that's the image I want to use for schools of charity. You know, we live in families, we go to workplaces, uh, we live in churches, all of which are not perfect. Uh, but you know what? They're going to, of course, we're not perfect either. But by living there, if we stay with family, with charity, with the community, with church, what will happen is they're going to knock all the rough edges off of us. You can't survive in a family. You can't survive in a church. You can't survive in a workplace or a community. Uh, you can't, at least you can't survive healthily without growing up. Um, you know, because we will just see our immaturities um, reading it there. And so, you know, when, when people live in monasteries, and I've, you know, I've lived in religious houses, but probably four different summers, I've spent some months in living with, at a Trappist monastery and so on. Um, you know, you have like 25 or 30 people living together in a building. It's a fishbowl. It is a fishbowl. You can't hide anything. You can't hide your bodily smells and you can't hide your faults, you know, and it just forces you to, um, to grow up. Um, and so the, it's, it's like the, the, the gravel polishing the rocks. It knocks the edges off you. It knocks the sand out of you. Um, and, and you're forced to grow up. You know, I want to emphasize this one because today there's so much emphasis, part which is healthy, but part which isn't on individuality in our culture, where, you know, our individual rights, and, and oftentimes we won't submit ourselves to community. You know, that's partly, and I hope this isn't going to be harsh when I say this, but when people say, I'm spiritual but not religious, which means I want to do spirituality on my own terms. Now that can be wonderful. It can also be very, very dangerous, which means I never have to let myself be confronted. I never have to let myself be challenged. If you're in a family or you're in a church or you're in a, in a religious community, <clears throat> you are going to be challenged and you're going to be challenged strongly, you know, um, and also you're going to be living. Um, let, me, let me qualify this. I want to do this very, very carefully, but importantly, you know, that, um, Today, we have all this literature, and it's a good literature, um, about dysfunctional families. So they talk about you know, dysfunctional families, dysfunctional churches, dysfunctional communities, dysfunctional organizations, um, dysfunction. Now, there isn't anything wrong with that literature except for one thing, and that is that that, that literature of dysfunction often gives you the impression, maybe they don't want to, but they give you the impression that somewhere there are functional families and there are functional churches and there are functional communities and there are functional workplaces that there aren't we're, we're all it's only a question of how bad is yours you know we all because we ourselves um you know are not perfect so we're always going to be working in an imperfect situation and so on um but this it's a struggle but the payoff is that all the different bruising of the stuff we're going to take in community, um, it's a school of charity. And it's the only school of charity. We're not going to learn charity by ourselves somewhere. We're not going to psych ourselves into charity. Um, like maturity, we're going to be dragged into it, forced into it by people who, are, who force us to grow up, our families and uh, our communities. So when we talk about you're living in a domestic monastery, while well, you're living in a a school of charity. Then let me do this last one, then we'll stop for questions, and that is do vigils when the angels of the night summon you. Um, it's interesting, I talked before about meeting the angels of the hour, but I want to single this one out for special uh, uh, ex ex explication. You know, if you ever live with Trappist monks, and I've lived with them several summers and so on, and sometimes for a couple of months on a stretch and so on, they do something they call vigils, which means about three, four o'clock at night, they ring the bell and everybody gets up and everybody goes to chapel. And in the darkness, they do this set of prayers they call vigils. It takes about 45 minutes and you have some readings and so on. And you sit and you sit in the darkness, this is being happening to you, you know? Now, then they go back, some go back to bed, some pray and take walks and so on but they always do this hour at night called vigils. So you might ask yourself, well, why don't they do it during the day? Um, you know, well, well, you can say 
45 minutes before you go to bed or when you get up in the morning and so on. Why, why did you do it at night? Well, because there's a special angel that you can only meet at night. Let, let me, uh, I want to be um, crass with this, but let, let me um, give you a pagan example of this. I mentioned before at the beginning when I talked about um, um, people who are doing this, and one of them is, is James Hillman, who's an agnostic. Hillman's not even a believer, but he has a wonderful book on aging called The Force of Character. And in the book, he has chapters on what happens to us when we age, okay? And what nature does to us. And he has this idea that nature is going to turn you all into monks. He said, nature is going to turn you into a monk. So I'll give you an example of that. He says, you know, when you get older, oh, sorry about this, it's colorful, but it's, it's accurate. He says, when you reach a certain age, you can't sleep through the night anymore. Sometime during the night, you have to get up and go to the bathroom. Okay. Now, then you go back to bed, but you can't fall asleep immediately. He said, and then he says, uh, the angels of night come around you. You know, um, if you're a pagan, you believe in the goddess of night called Nyx. But if you're a Christian, you believe the angels of night. Do you know what the angels of night are? He said, they're called grudges, recrimination, bitterness, anger, unresolved tension in your life. And they're going to keep you awake. He said, because you have to deal with them. Because you won't deal with them during the day. You know, um, it's got to happen to you at night. The, these angels of night, they summon you, you know. Um, so it's very important because we do live with a lot of grudges and we do live with angers and so on. And during the day and the busyness of the day and during the sunlight, we, we can push them aside. Um, we don't have to deal with them when we can't sleep at night. The next time you can't sleep, something just will let you be. Um, you can say to yourself, I'm, I'm a monk and I'm dealing with the angels of the night. I, I'm meeting an angel that I don't want that I refuse to meet during the daytime, and I'm meeting this angel here tonight. So I want to summarize that I'll do the up to last two and the, the, the next time, but I want to go back to the beginning and, um, you know, the principles so that St. Benedict wrote the principles of monasticism, and he put them under two words, ora et labora, pray and work. And then he said, like, now, he wrote that for monks inside of a monastery. But what we're trying to do, and that's what I'm trying to do with the book, Domestic Monastery, you see, but those principles can be wonderfully inspirational and wonderfully guiding for us in our lives outside of monasteries. And I think there can be a wonderful, uh, uh, it can be a rich kind of metaphorical canopy we put ourselves under, say, this is my domestic monastery. I'm living in this domestic monastery. So he said, Regulate your life by the domestic bell. Stay inside your cell. Let the cell teach you everything that you need to know. Pray, work, be quiet, you know, understand your family is a school of charity. And then, not all the time, but when, when it can't be helped, let the angels of night summon you and uh, deal with them because you won't deal with them during the day. So um, I want to spend the last... Um, time of this here uh, in, 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 uh, in the question and answer. And um, let me just start with some of the, the questions here. First one says, isn't God with us all the time? And prayer just makes us aware of that. Absolutely. And actually, it's a beautiful thought. No, God is with us all the time. We don't pray to be with God. <laughs> we pray to make ourselves aware that God is with us. It's a beautiful thought. Thanks. Uh, next one, um, and, and I recognize the name. It's wonderful to hear from you, Kirby. Uh, also, how is this concept diminished in our fad, fast food generation? Wow, that, that, that's really a, a topic for, for a whole hour. Um, first of all, I'll admit that I like fast foods. Um, but, um, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's almost the antithesis of monasticism. You know, uh, let me say something about fast foods. You know, I, uh, in my earlier years when I was really strong in social justice, I think, you know, but I used to look at companies like McDonald's and so on. I just kind of thought, how awful. But now I've changed my mind a lot because, you know, when I find at McDonald's, you find the poor there. Uh, a lot of poor people are at McDonald's. And uh, 
I go there sometimes say, no, I, I, I'm a poor person and so on. Um, and, uh, but, but just the idea of eating fast, of, of um, it's not the food, but it's just the, of not taking time, of not valuing, not being connected to food, that's very unmonastic. Um, next question is, says, um, just say it's marvelous to see you, stay well, thank you, okay. Um, you mentioned Catherine D. Can you give us the full correct? Uh, uh, now I forget which which Catherine D. I mentioned. Uh, uh, or maybe it'll come back to me as as, as I'm looking through the. Uh, oh no! Yes, sorry, got it. Catherine Doherty, D O H E R T Y. She is the foundress of um, Madonna House. She's found in New York. It's now in Ontario. It's a wonderful religious community. They work with the poor. They're, they're semi-monastic, the way they live and so on. Um, it's a community of both men and women. But um, oftentimes she's called the Baroness. So you can look her up on the internet. Um, marvelous woman. Now, next question. I live alone and I feel I'm missing out um, on the school of charity in my home life. How can I practice this better? Ah. Okay, um, and maybe this is something I can address more on Friday. You know, there are two types of monasteries. There's monasteries where people live together, you know, the Benedictines, the Trappists, a lot of convents and so on. Um, but there's also what they call hermits, hermeticals. And notice the hermits, they're a monk, but they live alone. And so what you want to find is you want to get the rules for uh, Hermits try to live all these principles, except they have to live them alone. And so, um, um, you know, so you have, to, you have to, then don't think of yourself so much as a monastic monk. Think of yourself as a hermit monk. You're like um, Carlo Corretto living the desert by yourself for 24 years. And that brings its own challenges, but it also brings its own, um, uh, its own graces. Then the next one, I, um, what's your comment about suffering of today because COVID is, is, uh, is polishing our faith? And follow up the question, how do we sustain a vision of polishing uh, is for the good? Okay, I, I taking for granted, you mean polishing as the, the rocks, that's the sand polishing the rocks. Actually, you know, you, you, you pointed to a very good image. You know, um, remember I said a couple of times during the thing that we, we, um, we're dragged, we don't walk into maturity by willpower, walk into, uh, you know, goodness and so on. We're dragged into it. And I know this COVID-19, as, as bad as it is, it's dragging us into things that, you know, it's making us think, it's making us aware of vul our vulnerability, or that, you know, teaching us again that we're not in control. And I think it's also going to teach us, we're going to have to relearn the value of prayer. Uh, you know, we've forgotten how to pray because we don't think we need to pray. And this virus is teaching us, we need, is teaching us all those things. It, it's polishing us like no stones have in recent centuries. Now, the next one says, I notice I wake up at night at around three o'clock a lot. And so does my twin sister. Does that mean anything? Well, <laughs> if I'm James Hillman, I'd say that, uh, you're meant to do vigils, you know, um, doesn't mean you have to get up and pray, but you know, what, whatever, uh, uh, whatever's happening to you uh, during that time, uh, that, that can be providential. Uh, just, you know, share something. I once did a 40 day directed retreat with, with the Jesuits in, 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 uh, in Ontario and I had a very good director and you know, on, with the Jesuits exercises, they suggest you get up at night to pray and do vigils. But he said to me, they said, go to bed. If God wants you to pray, God will wake you up. If you wake up, get up and pray. If not, just sleep through the night, you know? And so um, if it's happening to you, work with it. When it doesn't happen, you don't have to work with it. Now, as a single person, I've been seriously and chronically ill for 20 years, and so far, with too far too much diff, uh, solitude. Where is the community? The ill are often forgotten. Does solitude replace community in the maturing process? If so, how? 
again, these are wonderful questions. They're huge questions that, that would again merit an hour. Uh, let me just say something quickly here. Um, first of all, um, um, you know, oftentimes people have more than enough monastic silence in their lives. You know, just the story when I was provincial, we'd, we'd meet with our priest in August and we'd plan our retreat in May. And always the question of silence would come up. And some priests said, I won't go to retreat if there isn't any silence. And some other priests would say, look, I live alone. I live by myself. I get all the silence I need. I, when I get together, I need, I need some community, you know. Um, and so sometimes when we're conscripted into silence like this, really, I, the, the, you need to seek out, then be, seek out like a Benedict and say, I, I'm enough tired of being a Trappist or a hermit, I want some Benedictine community. So try to find community. Um, and you yourself answer it, you know, we need to, to try to find solitude inside of our silence. Um, there I recommend um, one of the earliest books by Henry Nowen. He wrote a magnificent book called, you know, um, uh, Reaching Out. And he has a, a chapter in there called From Restlessness to Solitude. I highly recommend that chapter. I'll do a couple of more, but I notice the time is running out. Um, the monastic life is chosen, but during this time, we are not choosing to be in the house, straining relationships with the closest ones. How do we enjoy what we're not choosing? How to change our routines and having to be together all the time? Don't want to sound ungrateful or not loving my family. I just want to be more in touch with God and grateful for the situation that is difficult. I'm glad you worded that because, you know, I think there's a lot of, we can have a lot of false romanticism about staying at home, um, but this is going to be a really trying time in the monastery. Uh, really, you know, and in fact, I really worry and I pray every day because I'm lucky we're priests, we still have mass at our table, but we pray every day for people who are trapped in their homes and who are susceptible and victims to domestic violence. Uh, and also just to, to, uh, to the, 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 the closeness, the fishbowl. Sometimes you can love people, but if you put it all together in a fishbowl, this can really be trying. Uh, so I just want to add sympathy to this and just kind of we, um, pray, pray a lot for just the grace. But, but sometimes it's helpful to recognize and say, look, um, this isn't little home in the prairies, you know, and if, if we don't get some air, we may strangle each other and so on. And sometimes even naming it can be helpful. Then once that many of our friends are spiritual and do not attend church, I like what you said about being not being challenged. What would you do with friends who believe that spirituality is all we need? Well, uh, Socrates says there's nothing that needs us that we have to be as gentle as with as when we try to dispel an illusion. That's an illusion. We have to be very, very gentle in dispelling it. First of all, there's something good in it. Being spiritual is better than not being spiritual. Um, but you know what we have to somehow get across to people is that Christianity, which is not true for Buddhism or for Hinduism, but Christianity um, is a, and, and Judaism is the same. We are religions of community. You know, we are called to come to God in families and communities, not alone. You know, the, the great French philosopher, Pegue, Charles Pegue, I love to see once said, uh, you know what's going to be the first question St. Peter asks you when you get to heaven or Jesus, whoever you meet there. And he said it in French. He said, Où sont les autres? Where are the others? Why are you here alone? Uh, uh, we need to challenge ourselves. I'll do one more and then the, I'll, the rest I, I can pick up on Friday. He says, I like the idea of the family as a school of charity and embracing yearning towards gentleness in ourselves and others. Yet I feel like these are lessons I'm only beginning to grasp since I've a fairly, I have fairly young, since I have fairly young and active children, eight and 10, I struggle to, to imagine how I could teach or lead in such lessons and learnings. Do you have ideas and specific practices or a resource to lead for this beginner mom? And I'm going to not give the name, but it's from Saskatchewan, which is my hometown, so uh, my, my home province and so on. Well, I want to say this to you, um, because the time is short here, we're over time. 
Uh, I'm going to recommend a book to you, and it's called by a book by a woman called Wendy Wright. Wendy Wright, W R I G H T. Um, a wonderful woman. There's raised kids. Now her kids are raised, but she wrote a book when she was a young mother. She wrote a book called Sacred Dwelling. Sacred Dwelling. So I'd recommend it. It's a book written about how, as a mother, uh, you, you can, you know, how you stay in your cell as a mother. Okay, I want to thank you for all the rest of the questions, but there's a, a number of them left, and, and that, I, I think we need to stay within the hour. And so I'm going to turn it back to Sister Estelle. Thanks so much, Father Ron. It was really so moving and inspirational for each one of us, monastic or home dwellers or families. Thank you very much. Your words are a real inspiration during this time. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, Father Rollheiser's book, they are available through your local booksellers. And if your local booksellers are open for business, we do recommend going to them. And there's Domestic Monastery right now. I'm also on Father Ron's website, which is ronrollheiser.com. And of course, from our website, which is paracletepress.com. If you're lucky enough to order today, you get 20% off your book and you also get free shipping and that's today only. So please do try to reach out and get a book today. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed this retreat talk as much as we did. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety. And we hope you will join us for more of these times together with our authors. Our calendar of Zoom events is available on our website, paracletepress.com. That's paracletepress.com. Thank you all so much. God bless you all. Thank you, Sister Estelle.